All right, guys, coming up next, we've got Mike, Sean, and Sam Frenzy with Element Building Sciences. Today, we are gonna go learn a little bit about mold and asbestos, when to worry, why to worry, and maybe when not to worry. So stick around and like and subscribe, and let's go ahead and get there. All right, so what do we have here? Did this come from the ceiling, or did you think something broke? What do you think happened here? Well, what I think happened, the ladies' restroom is right on the other side of this wall. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there may have been a toilet overflow or a small leak or something. But this is really common uh, for the water <clears throat> when it gets on the floor. It will flow underneath the walls yep. and into adjoin pardon me, adjoining spaces. I don't think it came from above. Well, I you don't can see, see there's no, no signs on the wall, right? So being as this, wa this did come from a toilet, um, are there immediate concerns when there's a toilet overflow? I mean, should people be oh, yeah. concerned for their health right away or what's Not necessarily the right away, but there are some concerns with water that comes out of the toilet. Um, the IICRC S500, which is the standard uh, for water mitigation, categorizes water into three different categories. Category one is a clean water source, which would be uh, a supply line to a kitchen sink or something like that. Okay. Uh, category two, which has some pathogenic uh, uh, problems with it, and the longer it sets can cause some health concerns. The third is category three, which is really just sewage or something grossly contaminated. Depending on where this water came from, it could be category one if it was a fresh water source. It could be category two if it came from the toilet tank, not beyond the P-trap. If, if it was a toilet source and it came from beyond the P-trap, so basically where the main drain line uh, runs out of the building and hooks up to the city service, that would be a category three, and that would okay. be considered grossly contaminated. Uh, when you think of the different things that can be in drain water, uh, you have, <clears throat> pardon me, uh, you have uh, viruses, and you have, yeah. uh, yeah. <laughs> so you can have viruses and bacteria, E. coli, uh, Shigenella. You can have parasites if it comes from overflowing streams. Uh, Giardia is very common uh, to have in category three water. So depending on the source, uh, depends on what the response action is for this particular water damage. Mm -hmm. All right, so today we are at Element Building Sciences, and we are with Mike, Sean, and Sam Frenzy. Um, been telling you guys a little bit about these two and why I was excited to be here this week. Um, mold mitigation and asbestos mitigation are two things that I think are highly misunderstood. And I also feel like uh, the industry has scared many folks. And so, and having them come to my office, ACCU, and give a presentation, um, naturally they were very calming about what, how you should approach both the mold and the asbestos when it comes to mediation. So board members, um, they're volunteers. You're not supposed to um, get elected and all of a sudden know everything you're supposed to do. So if all of a sudden you have a loss, we hope that you YouTube search it and you find this video and it brings the content that you need to be successful in managing it. So why don't we start off by talking about the mold side, if that's okay. Sure. Um, when when you came to my office and you said mold is all around us all the time, our immune systems are built to support that. So when you see mold, don't necessarily automatically think that it's adversely affecting your health. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct, James. Mold spores are everywhere. We are breathing them in right now as we're having this conversation. We will never not breathe in mold spores. Uh, over the, the years, our immune systems have become used to uh, filtering those out of our system. And so uh, some we work with uh, seven or eight different physicians around town, and most of their patients uh, are very immunocompromised and they're really ill. Okay. And uh, so we get a referral from one of these physicians and we then interview the homeowner or the customer just to see what's going on. You know, was there, have they been in a, a recent water damage in their home? Uh, have they moved from another part of the country into Colorado? It's a lot drier here, right. less mold spores compared to like the Gulf states or coastal states, things like that. So less mold yep. in Colorado? Less mold. So somebody is still, still the possibility for mold. Sure. Oh yeah, yeah. sure. 
Oh, one what? of the reasons that a doctor may tell someone, hey, listen, maybe get up to Colorado um, if you're experiencing I, we've, it. We've had some customers mm -hmm. that exactly that. Huh. Yep, or Wyoming or something because uh, the air is much drier here and it doesn't support that mold color pro proliferation. Holy smokes. <laughs> um, you know, like uh, a place that's habitually much uh, more wet. Right, yeah, it needs, a, it needs a food source. Water's yeah. the food source. So let's talk about the foundation of mold and what it is. Um, sure. So uh, what is it? What does it do? And what does it need to grow? Yeah. So mold is, it's just a naturally occurring organism. It's everywhere in the, on the planet. And really what it's, it is, has evolved to do over time is to decompose and break down uh, different organic materials. You'll see it a lot in forests, uh, trash dumps, things like that. And it really is a good garbage disposer. The thing about it is when you have mold in the built environment, meaning homes and businesses and things like that, the construction of these buildings has really evolved and changed over the years. When we had uh, the oil embargo in the early 70s, and Sam was probably 40 then. Uh, <laughs> oh, he just Richard, got you. <laughs> 40 or 45, something. Close. Yeah, back in the early 70s. Uh, the uh, construction contractors, uh, you know, efficiency, uh, thermal efficiency became a very big topic because we were uh, having the oil. And so homes and buildings, uh, if you've ever been driving through a construction site and you see the frame of, of the building up and then the white or black, the Tyvek wrap, that plastic wrap that's around it, uh -huh. that was never done before the early 70s. And what it does is it provides a vapor barrier yeah. between the inside and the outside. So if you have a home built in the 40s and 50s out of lath and plaster, there's a natural, uh, quite a bit of air leakage into the home and out of the home. One of the theories or one of the concepts of a water damage is uh, if I have, if we have a wet office here, the vapor pressure in this room will go up and it will start to push these wet um, water molecules throughout the building and it will start to grow mold. And so when we started putting these vapor barriers on all of these structures, now, if we have a water damage in here, that moisture has nowhere to travel to. It cannot escape anymore. So since the early 70s, there's been a great uh, growth of mold inside of the built environment. And that's why uh, it is. it just seems to be more prevalent. I frequently hear from customers, well, gosh, we live in Colorado. There's no mold here. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have the right environmental conditions, you will have mold. I've seen I've seen some well, I've seen some mushrooms, uh, some massive mushrooms here in Colorado. It's, so it, it, yeah, it is very prevalent. Yeah, and there's hundreds species. of thousands of species of mold, different kinds of mold. Yeah, and some people are, you know, yeah. affected by it. Others aren't. My mother lives in a hundred year old home in upstate New York. It's mold infested. She's not affected. She's ninety eight years old. Still yeah. lives there. It doesn't affect her. Yeah. Does not affect her. Yeah. So what I, I've spoken with some physicians. And the, the medical portion uh, or the, the medical information that we are getting now is much better than it was five, 10 years ago. We would get reports of an office building where people would go in on Monday, start feeling sick. By Friday, they were completely wiped out. They would go home and uh, breathe good air and then come back on Monday and it would, they would start to crash again. And some people refer to it as sick building syndrome. And most of the time, it has been uh, some type of unknown water intrusion with mold growing inside of a wall cavity or ceiling cavity like that. Uh, you know, for mold growth, you don't need a lot of things to make it happen. Again, the mold spores are naturally here. They're on every surface. We just can't see them. We're breathing them in. I think a lot of people are most concerned about this uh, sick building syndrome, especially if you live in a condominium style association mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where um, you are not, you don't have access to all the other areas and there could be water uh, damage. And, and so if you are a concerned homeowner and trying to find out whether or not your um, health is being affected, what are some, what are some of the remedies? What are the steps that they can take to determine whether or not mold is a problem and this sick building syndrome is happening. Sure. So we do, uh, we have a very 
uh, tried and true process of doing a mold investigation. Uh, we'll always do a good half hour interview with the customer or the, the homeowner because, you know, they, the perception may be that mold is the culprit when it could be something completely uh, different or, mm -hmm. or unrelated. So we ask them about their personal health. Uh, we ask them how long they've lived in the home. Has it, as they, as much as they know, has there ever been a water intrusion or a leaky roof, something like that? So we get an idea of what we're going to be looking at when we come out and do the inspection. Um, our inspection, uh, we have several different facets of it, James. Uh, always the most important is a very good visual inspection. And we will pay particular attention to those rooms in a home with the typical water sources, because that, you know, what mold needs to grow is moisture and a food source and a good temperature. So a, a where mold grows the best is in the temperature range of 68 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit, which just happens to be the comfort zone for humans. So, <laughs> so we, we get along well. Exactly. Yeah, we, we thrive together. Uh, so, you know, the mold spores are here. The, we add the moisture component from a leak or a water intrusion of some sort. Uh, the food source, there's many, many in a, in a built environment where we see a lot is on drywall paper, not necessarily the paint, but the drywall paper, mm -hmm. wood framing. I looked at a project in Keystone just Friday where a home inspector had come in to do an inspection, believe it or not, turned the shower on in the guest bathroom, hot water, and forgot to turn it off when he left. The shower ran, they think, for two weeks. So you have this hot, steamy, Who's picking up that bill? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. But when I went in there, I was actually really surprised. And I've seen a fair amount of mold. It was growing on pillows, blankets, uh, end tables, mattresses, obviously ceilings and walls. And the remediation for that is going to be complete demolition down to the framing. Uh, once the mold gets in there, you just cannot successfully remove it uh, and clean it up. Uh, carpets, pad, you name it. Yeah, it's all gone. So it can be very destructive in, inside if you're not controlling the moisture. So um, back to the question of yeah. what resources are available for somebody yeah. who thinks that there may be mold. So uh, number one, a thorough visual inspection yeah. is going to be a priority. Um, is uh, testing the, the mold on the inside and outside of mm -hmm. that unit step number two that's correct and it is uh again we go back to the, the fact that there are not very many regulations and so what our firm does and i think what most good consulting firms do is we'll do a comparison of mold samples we'll take we will always take an outdoor control sample just to see what the mold concentration is outside and what types of molds are there uh, then we go inside the home we do uh, air samples inside of the home it depends on uh, how many samples we collect uh, depends on how big the home is, what was wet, uh, really what our suspicions tell us. While we're doing that and letting our, our pumps run, uh, we always could bring an infrared camera in because a lot of mold, uh, you can't tell that it's growing. You know that something may be making you sick, but you just don't know where. By using infrared cameras, we're very quickly able to scan and look for wet spots in drywall, uh, behind toilets are very common around the shower surrounds. Uh, so we use an infrared camera. We also use a, a non-penetrating moisture meter. So if we go uh, very typical, we see uh, in, a sh in a bathtub surround that has tile on the wall. How many times do you seal that like you're supposed to? I think once a year is what they recommend or something where you just put a clear sealant on it. Over years, the water will simply migrate through the grout into the drywall behind it. And it's more, it's more common than not that when we put a moisture on, or moisture meter on a uh, bathroom tile, it's wet behind it. It's almost always the case because that, that maintenance just isn't happening. What? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's crazy. And I, I definitely want to take that into consideration. Yeah. Set this on this camera. Sure. Um, he, actually, he actually paid attention when we, we did our first Presentation yeah. over there. 
to know that you take samples outside and inside. Yeah. I'm impressed, James. No, appreciate it. All right. Um. So as we complete our inspection, we've collected air samples. If we see something suspect and it looks like mold, we'll take a, a we call it a bulk sample. So either a Q-tip type of a swab or a tape sample. Something very, very important, and I even train our inspectors on this. It can look like mold. It probably is mold. But until we have a lab result that says it is, it is not mold. We're the, and we're the environmental professional. We don't come in and freak people out and say, oh, yeah, you've got mold here. Holy smokes, look at that. No, no, no. We call it SMG, suspect microbial growth. It is not mold until the lab report says, okay, it is mold. Suspect microbial growth. So just because it's microbial growth does not mean that it's gonna test positive for mold. And this is where uh, I think there's a lot of value in understanding uh, that there is mold all around us, there's microbial growth, but it is not necessarily harmful to your health. If you're an owner in a community and you're curious about whether or not mold is affecting your health, We've given you some steps you can follow. You're going to want to call a hygienist and have them come out uh, uh, to look into that situation. From a community management perspective, especially if you're in a condo uh, style community, uh, many times you may feel that because it didn't originate in your home, the association should pay for it. Every document is going to vary. It may be something that you have to pay for out of pocket to find out that there is a problem. And then if you can prove it, then the HOA may pick it up from there. So notify your management company, have a conversation with your manager. Um, if they are unwilling uh, to take the steps and you want to, those are the steps that you would take to find out whether or not your health is being adversely affected by mold. Mm -hmm. uh, but until it has been tested, it is not mold. I think that's a great point. Yeah, it is. I would also offer that, you know, make sure that the environmental consultant you are working with, make sure that you vet them really well. Uh, believe it or not, there are those folks out there uh, that believe you need an air sample from every major room in a home. Mm -hmm. Or uh, they can actually get people scared, more scared than they probably already were. Uh, so ethics can be- It's uh, huge. Yeah, it's a huge. It, um, if they want it to be hot so they can, get additional work or, yeah. you know, to charge more, they can test every room. Exactly. So uh, finding a company that is ethical about how they approach the situation should be also be a part. Yeah, it's, it's so important. And, you know, we run into that all the time and not just in the environmental world. I mean, it's every contractor out there, you know, it depends on uh, how busy they are and do they need more work? And there are ways to interpret the data uh, when we do our data interpretation. So when we receive those lab results, you know, I can look at them several different ways. We always take into effect or into account uh, one who the client is, but really the goal here is to be completely objective as much as possible. Uh, we, at the end of the day, we don't really care if there is mold in a building or not. Our job as a good environmental consultant is to go out and do a very thorough inspection and just see what we have. It may be there, it may not be there. We simply collect data and report the data. If there is some type of elevated fungal condition, uh, which is another nice way to say uh, you have mold in your home, we just have an elevated fungal condition, uh, you know, then we'll provide you some a, a protocol to follow to get rid of it. And that's when they start working with the contract. Exactly. As, as environmental consultants, our job is not to is not to do the abatement. That's a whole separate issue. Yeah. We stay away from that. We believe that's a conflict of interest to to also do the abatement. Or vice versa, doing the abatement and being a the tester. Sort of tester. Exactly. So that would exactly. be uh, something to consider when you're trying to determine whether or not it, it's in the home. Um, yeah. As you know, you should separate those two as a matter of Absolutely. due diligence. <clears throat> yes. I think it's very important. And ethically. It just, yeah. So I, I was in the restoration business for 16 years before I transitioned over to the environmental consulting. So I've done, I can't tell you how many mold remediation projects or building dry downs. We have the expertise to advise you on how to do them the right way, but we on purpose do not do them because we want to be that third party objective entity that basically referees how things happen. 
yes, it was a good remediation. Here's the laboratory data that says it, or no, we may have to do a little more cleaning or demo or something like that. So uh, again, with an unregulated industry, there's a propensity for um, more remediation contractors to self-test. And there is all, there are also environmental consultants that will dabble in mold remediation. And I'm not saying that anything they're doing is untoward. It is just something to be wary of, something to be cautious of. I agree. I think that it is incumbent upon the management company or the person ordering the work that they understand. The due diligence in that process is to separate out those two roles and responsibilities, right? That's amazing. Exactly. So um, more questions on mold, please put it in the comments below. We want to know what your questions are so we can answer them specifically. For today, we're going to move on to asbestos. And let's go ahead and talk about asbestos, what it is, um, what to be worried about, what not to be worried about. Of course. So asbestos, uh, when when you compare the regulations, you know, again, uh, there are very few mold regu regulations. Asbestos is highly regulated. And what it is, it's a naturally occurring mineral that is mined uh, most likely out of pit mines. Uh, Canada was a, a very large producer of asbestos. There's actually a city in Quebec or in uh, Canada, it's called oh. asbestos. Mm -hmm. And right outside the town, there's this huge open pit mine, just like you would dig up coal or something like that. And uh, so it's dug out of the ground. If you take away the health, the negative health impacts of it, it's a really good material because it doesn't conduct electricity. It does, yep. It doesn't take on heat, so it won't catch on fire. Exactly. Um, it doesn't burn. It doesn't burn. It's a really strong material. Yep. I think I saw in one of your presentations that, um, you know, back before we knew that it was a problem, they used to make children's clothes out of it. I thought yeah. I saw yes. a kid yeah. in like a bear costume yeah. or exactly. something. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I mean, that alone is probably dangerous enough, much less the people that were digging out of the mine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So are there any of those, well, obviously not left in the United States, but were we right. mining asbestos at some point? Huge. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, most of the asbestos, uh, homegrown asbestos in the United States came from a mine in Libby, Montana, which is a super fun site. And they've been cleaning that place up for many, many years, and they're going to continue and what they noticed, and something interesting too, is uh, after 9-11 in Lower Manhattan, the rates of uh, cancer-related diseases that almost spread out in, in that area because in some of the buildings, they had sprayed on fireproofing that had asbestos in it. So when the building so just blowing clouds, like asbestos spores all over the place, it just, well, you've seen pictures well, of the clouds and, yeah. and, you know, the dust and yeah. people running. There was a lot of asbestos there, and now, uh, nearly 20 years later, the incidence rates of, of cancer for folks that were working there, first responders, is is really growing. Same thing around Libby, Montana, because uh, back in the day, they didn't know what PPE was really. You know, nobody suited up, nobody put respirators on. They would dig it with a backhoe, dump it into the truck, and a plume of dust would come with, out. With COVID-19 going on, I'm pretty sure most of us are now very familiar with what PPE is, uh, but yeah. just for reference, PPE right. is... Uh, personal protective equipment. Yeah. And that is required. And in fact, I think these gentlemen have uh, told me that they, were, they will be happy to take me out on site um, if we can find a couple where um, that is, is, is okay. We're going to go out and take a look. Um, at a couple of these different scenarios so you can see firsthand what the process is. And uh, part of that process is PPE, um, making sure, and I think this is more on the contractor side because the contractors, when they go in to remediate, they need to be the ones knowledgeable enough to make sure that they suit up appropriately so they are not exposed to these things when, right. when they go exactly. to do the testing. Yeah. So we'll, we will get into that more. Yeah. Um, so... What um, we were having a conversation outside. I'm hoping we got on audio. If not, one of the things I wanted to talk about is if you are a community manager, a board member, and there's water damage um, from maybe the upstairs and the effect of the ceiling tiles and the walls, um, how how many square feet um, is there uh, before it needs to be tested and possibly remediated? You bet. So the state of Colorado is very uh, clear on this, and there's a couple uh, areas on the web that I can give you the, the web address, and you can actually read 
the guiding documents. And I will put that in the link below. Um, so you can just go ahead and click there and it'll bring up all the information. Yeah. What they, what the state of Colorado wants is anytime you're going to disturb any material and the EPA uh, thinks that, uh, or what they teach us is that the EPA suspects asbestos was put in over 3000 different materials, anything from roofing to car brakes to you name it. Um, when it comes to, to a home or something like that, 32 square feet in Colorado, that is the number, that's the trigger level. So you can remove up to 32 square feet of drywall without having it tested. You just must assume that it has asbestos in it. So uh, you wanna cover it with plastic and things like that. Greater than 32 square feet, you are mandated to have an asbestos abatement contractor remove that material. So if you're six feet tall and your your hand-to-hand -hand span is 36 inches, Right. Is uh six feet, six feet, yeah. Um, and that's that's more than thirty-two. Yeah, square feet. So if you can, uh, if you can reach out and not, and it's beyond your reach, then um, go ahead and get that test. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. What's nice about the, the testing is that it's a really quick process. We are in and out in about fifteen minutes, and we usually get lab results within about two hours of us dropping them at the lab. So even if you do have a wet building, we're not adding a bunch of time to it, to the process, but it will keep you out of the courtroom, guaranteed. One of my favorite stories was managing a high-rise association, and there was a water leak on, the, uh, on one of the top floors. Mm -hmm. And the uh, contractor that came in, because the homeowner called the contractor, um, the management company was not notified yet. Uh, so the contractor that comes in, decides to uh, tear down um, everything on the inside of the unit, put it in trash bags, drag it through the hall and the elevator, downstairs to the basement, out to the trash can. Mm -hmm. When uh, OSHA and the EPA got involved, I think it was the EPA, actually, um, they did get involved on some level. And let me tell you, they do not joke around. Um, the association then needed to get a qualified contractor to come in to do the uh, remediation. I promise you, you will spend more money going with the cheap option than going with a contractor that has a reputation for being able to service these types of asbestos spills. Because in this scenario, it was months <clears throat> of work uh, with the EPA and with the contractor, making sure that they were cleared out. We had to move people that would normally live on those floors yeah. to different units and pay for that. It was out of control. Yeah, Make sure you're working with qualified people. Absolutely. The thing about asbestos too, James, is if you look at it microscopically, the most common one is called chrysotile, and it looks almost like cotton. And it is, it's a very bundled thing like this, and, and it has hooks and barbs on it. So uh, in a major asbestos bill or something like that, anything, the only items that you can save is, is hard furniture like this. So a table, you can have a vacuum it off and wipe it down. But then when you think of the cost of doing that, because this is not a cleaning company that's doing this, this is an asbestos abatement contractor in full PPE, full respirators, uh, cleaning everything. You know, quite honestly, this table would not have the value to save it. So that uh, would kind of led me on to another thought, because I know a lot of, uh, a lot of people will, you know, say, Oh, it's not that big of a deal. So if you have, uh, you're tearing up a floor in your house and you come across something that is suspiciously asbestos tile mm -hmm. and it's, you know, quite a bit of square footage. Um, and you know, you decide as the owner or the contractor, oh, hey, we're going to hush hush this thing and we're going to chisel it out. We're going to throw it away. What are the consequences? It depends on, on who you are. And so if it is your home, your primary residence, uh, it's not a rental property or something like that. Uh, Colorado Regulation 8 allows you to remove what you want to remove uh, without any PPE requirement. It's just not identified. You don't have to do it. However, uh, once you break, if you're in a condo building or something like that, once you break the plane of your front door, if you're doing that work inside and asbestos fibers migrate out and someone um, that's a nosy neighbor, Hey, what are you doing? Uh, what's going on in there? What's in the bags? It happens. It really, really does. 
you are now responsible for everything related to the asbestos material it, that you well, remove. Yeah, once it gets to the common area. Yeah, once it goes out into the hallways. And what if the, what if contractors were doing a single family home and they try and do it and somebody becomes wise? What, uh, being a contractor should have been knowledgeable yeah. about asbestos, decided <clears throat> to do it anyway. What's the uh, what's the consequence for them? There's uh, all kinds of different enforcement activities. They're certainly going to be talking to the state of Colorado. Uh, the state has been uh they're getting a reputation now when they drive around so if you have an asbestos investigator and they see a large dumpster in front of a home they will pull over and they'll stop the contractor and ask him let me see your asbestos inspection report and if you don't have one they're going to immediately red tag the project until you prove either that you that had yep you had an asbestos inspection done and it was negative hopefully that's the case because if you didn't, the contractor is going to be you're going to be very unhappy for a while. And uh, we have heard anything from uh, fines to, in a very extreme case of uh, it's a felony, it's an imprisonment. There was a, a guy that was removing drywall and it had asbestos in it. And instead of even taking it to a regular landfill, he was putting it into a storage facility that he was renting. Well. One way or another, he was found out. All of the items in this entire storage facility were disposed of. He had eight, eight years, I think he's still in, in federal penitentiary. So it depends on really eight years of federal penitentiary. Yeah. So wow. it's, it really depends on how many people did you potentially impact with this. So when you say a condo building, potentially, there's a lot of people there. If it has an elevator in the building, those are just like pistons. And so they push air up and down. We've all felt those air pressure changes when you're riding in an elevator. It was, it was extreme. Yeah. Uh, and they, they take it very seriously. I cannot stress enough. Yeah. Um, you don't want that out of work. Uh, you don't want to put it on your manager. You don't want it on your association. And no. You certainly don't want the expenses that come with it yeah. because it gets, it gets out of control expensive. Um, depending on what you're working with, asbestos, is that normally covered in insurance or is that an exclusion? Right now it seems to be covered, but it is an additional rider. And so the coverage will not be a full house. Uh, like if your house burns down, they write, come on, write a check. It's usually neither five or $10,000 increments, depending on how much you purchase. I think as the asbestos costs keep continuing to rise, a lot of carriers are going to just start excluding it, just writing it right out of the just policy, like they're doing with mold and, and lead based paint and different things like that. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say next mold is excluded. Um, it's an exclusion and almost every insurance policy. I've not seen mold be accepted. Yeah. As, uh, most likely. Yeah. I even talk to my insurance agent every year, even though what I know what my policy says, all right, uh, am I still covered for a sewer backup? In my basement, yes, I've got 10,000 coverage on that. Okay, what's the most I can get for asbestos abatement? Because I actually live in a home that has asbestos. I mean, don't think I'm dying yet, am I, Sam? Not yet. No, no. a little peaked. No. Uh, but so it's really good to, you know, your insurance agent is a great source, too, um, to let you know what, what you're a couple what, for. What you're you're yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, this has been amazing uh, today. I still have a lot of questions, as I'm sure uh, the viewers will. Um, so I want to continue this conversation uh, with both sure. of you. Definitely like to get out and do a little show and tell. Absolutely. That would be incredible. Yep. Um, if, if they hadn't noticed, he's the smart one and I'm the pretty one. So that's how this goes. So if they hadn't if, if they had we need to have a counseling session after this. Uh oh. Yeah. Um, one thing I like to do uh, for each person that decides to uh, help educate our industry is um, allow both of you just to kind of give a quick little spiel about why choose Element. Yeah. I I can it's 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 for me it's it's rather simple when I when I chose Element to to work for. Um, and decided to come back to work. I just I said I'm I'm only going to work for people that I know and love, and uh, uh, that I know are going to do the right job. 
that are going to be ethically sound and um, efficient, and they're going to treat each customer like it's the first time. Each job, it's like it's the first everyone. first time. Everyone, yeah. so everyone is treated the same. From my customers to my managers, I appreciate the ethics and the knowledge that you bring. Sure. Um, you know, there's some managers in this industry that have 20 years of experience and they know better. And there's managers who are green and starting to learn the ropes and can be easily taken advantage of. And so right. to uh, make sure that the end user, my customer, is taken care of and making sure that the management staff is uh, taken care of. And, you take the time to try and additionally train them. Of um, course, yeah. you know, it's a it's a proper approach. You so. do business yeah. right, and people 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 refer you. People come back. You treat them wrong the first time. And yeah, you're done. Yeah, the you know the the principles are very simple. Do the right thing. Do it at a fair price. Uh, exceptional service, and uh, try and have a lot of fun. That's try to have a lot. Of that's fun. what we do. We're always uh, when we're off camera. We're joking and all kinds of kooky stuff like that. Well, hopefully we get some of that on camera. <laughs> so, gentlemen, appreciate it very much. Um, I'll Thank be you. back here shortly and we'll continue this adventure. Thank you. So, gentlemen, until next time. <laughs>